Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Youth Matters with your host Sakina Mushtaq Habib once again. I'm very pleased to have all of you join in today once again for an enlightening session and I would personally like to thank you all for the tremendous support and encouragement that you always give uh, to Youth Matters on Hidayat TV. To begin with, today's episode will focus on trauma and mental health multiple physical emotional and social changes including exposure to poverty abuse or violence can make adolescents vulnerable to mental health problems therefore today's conversation will highlight about coping strategies witnessing violent trauma understanding its impact and how to stay resilient in the face of tyranny with registered sites, the Muslim leader, Biraq Hussein. We have had Sister Biraq earlier with us on this platform, and since she has an expertise in the field of mental health, we have some good news to tell you, and that is that Sister Biraq and I will be bringing to you current discussions monthly on mental health matters where we will be highlighting key points to do with the very recent mental health topics for you to engage in only on Hidayat TV. That's one for a start. Now as we move on, for those of you who might not know Sister Barak very well, I would like to take the opportunity to briefly introduce her. So Barak Hussain is a Canadian Iraqi registered psychotherapist and uh, she's practicing at the health and counseling services at Carleton University for the past 13 years where she helps students from all sorts of backgrounds through issues ranging from anxiety, depression, stress, culture shock, identity challenges, suicide, relationships, issues, abuse, and more. Outside the university, she's known as the Muslim counselor. And she's a very passionate public speaker in Muslim mental health, social justice, domestic violence, women issues, Islamic issues, and poetry. She has worked locally and internationally on a variety of mental health initiatives, including spearheading the Serenity Islamic Mental Health Awareness Initiative. And she also speaks on a variety of Islamic and psychological issues, bridging the connection and misconceptions around Islam and mental health within Muslim communities, professional, psychological, academic, as well as other faith and cultural audiences. Working with youths and parents with cross-cultural generational dialogues, as well as motivational and mindfulness talks, Barak continues to encourage people to reach their full potential with the motto of inspire, heal, and empower. Without much further ado, I would now like to welcome Sister Barak Hussain on this platform, and we would like to welcome her. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Barak. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, and I look forward to having our monthly discussions, inshallah. Inshallah, Sister Barak, it's an absolute honor uh, having you join me on Youth Matters once again. And um, since today's topic is very evident, which clearly points to our discussion about um, trauma and mental health, we know for a fact that there's been and still going on a lot of world crisis around the globe. First, we see that it started in Afghanistan with the terrorist attack at the Sayyid al-Shuhada Mosque, where young girls were killed. And then we saw, we see the atrocities uh, Palestine went through, and to date, it is still going through. So first and foremost, my question to you would be that, how would you define trauma? 
ان شاء الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وال محمد just like to start that this is a very sensitive topic and it could be triggering for people who have experienced any sort of trauma or anything that could have impacted their mental health over the years so i just want to put it out there that if any of you do get impacted with, with what we are discussing today to please reach out to your local mental health support or spiritual support. There's also the Nasiha helpline that you can access worldwide free as well as the Muslim Youth Helpline. You can easily find them on Instagram, social media, as well as on the internet, inshallah. So I just wanted to put that out there first before we get into the discussion in more depth. So when trying to understand trauma, it's really important to get into a bit of details. There's many levels to this uh, understanding of it. And this understanding, um, I'm giving to you from research, from my own clinical practice, as well as the interactions I've had over the years with professionals and of course with what we're seeing in my own personal processing of what we see in the world today. So psychological drama can be defined as the damage to the mind that occurs as a result of a distressing event. And this trauma is often the result of an overwhelming amount of stress that exceeds one's ability to cope or integrate the emotions involved with that experience. So post-traumatic stress disorder, that becomes a mental illness as a result perhaps of trauma. So it involves exposure to a trauma involving death or the threat of death, serious injury, including sexual violence. So when something is traumatic and it is very frightening, and overwhelming, of course, it can cause a lot of stress, right? And trauma is often unexpected. And many people yeah. say that they felt powerless to stop or change the event. And so it's that loss of control that we're seeing in the world today, the unexpected attacks or that constant fear, living in that constant fear, right? So we know it could right. include crime. We've seen these hate crimes here in North America and Canada recently in London and another attack recently, Islamophobic attacks, right? So these types of crimes or yeah. any crimes, really. you've got natural disasters. And we've seen many of those over the years, accidents, car accidents, plane accidents. And of course, what we're focusing and, and looking at in light of world events, world or conflict, war rather, or conflict and other threats of life. So. It could be an event or situation that you yourself could experience, or it could happen to somebody else, right? Things happen to others yeah. that you may know yeah. or not know, including loved ones. So like we said, it can also result in PTSD, which causes very intrusive symptoms, such as re-experiencing the traumatic effect, the event, and people could have vivid nightmares, flashbacks or thoughts of the event that seem to come out of nowhere so they often avoid things that remind them of the event and of course what we're seeing today is this constant exposure to trauma that they cannot avoid these events they are living in the trauma as they're trying to survive right and right. traditionally what we see with ptsd is that people would be away from that event and that's not the case what we see in palestine what we're seeing people in in pakistan and afghanistan and even here now in north america with islamophobic hate right that constant fear of not getting away from that trauma right and it could come back and so internally it could have memories for you you know re-triggering memories your heart rate could increase tension in the body emotions could come out you can feel lonely you can feel a lot of pain because some of these traumatic events involve physical pain as well as emotion when we look at it from an external factor you've got sounds that could trigger right a, a, a could be somebody a person could remind you of somebody um yeah. could be the movies retelling stories smells arguments sure. Uh, whatever time of day related to that, uh, just a quick story I wanted to to put in. I was watching this yeah. uh, Iraq program, and we all know the history of Iraq, and especially in recent history with the um, attacks uh, from ISIS and so on and so forth. And uh, they were retelling stories of people's lives, and it was put in a, in a form of a movie. And I must say, although I wasn't personally connected to the attack of the Karada bombing that took place a few years back, I believe it was 2000 and 
15 or 16 if i'm not mistaken and so what happened there the, a whole mall was attacked a shopping center and people were just trying to make a living it was a few days before Eid, and so they were retelling a story from a young couple about to get married and it was so vivid was so vivid like i said i don't have a personal co connection to this in terms of family or friends or people i know who were taken in this attack but uh, I recall we did a huge um, vigil in auto and I was very active in that we felt helpless, out of control in terms of what we can and cannot do. We'll get into more detail with that later, but just quickly, like I said, I found myself just emotions and crying, tears. And I didn't even realize that until after. And I found it so fitting given that we're talking about this topic today. I can only imagine the people who pass by that mall or the anniversary or have anything related that could connect them to their loved ones there, how they would be feeling, right? So this is just a small, tiny example before we get into deeper issues. So Sister Barak, uh, in terms of mental health, how would you describe this trauma affecting those people trying to defend themselves in you know, such locations? Well, we cannot put ourselves in their shoes because unless you've experienced it, you cannot know, right? Like you, you would not know how it could affect them, but we see it from those who are on the ground, who are re reporting, who are interviewing. We see the footage and just recently what comes to mind is that young Palestinian boy that his eyes stayed open in shock in Gaza after the bombings took place by the by the Israeli right so you see right there what happened to this young boy it is the the eyes that were open showing that he was in shock right you can only imagine the trauma of the young children the living there and trying to defend themselves in these situations how do they even begin right because for them it's about survival right yeah and so they're trying to like you said, is that constant exposure like look at Afghanistan what happened to the Hazara girls in that school, that was the Shahada. It was it was horrific, was you know, and it did not get yeah. it did not get the media attention that it needed. That these young girls are out to seek an education in such a war torn place that they were targeted because of their creed, their faith, and because they happen to be women seeking an education. It, it's very sad, but what you see there is that not even a week or two later, I believe, there was another attack. And so there's this constant trauma that people are reliving. They cannot even begin to understand how it affects them th through their life. There's no, uh, let's say, stability, peace of growing in that sense. But they're definitely, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a heavy topic. As soon as you get into it, I, I recall a lot of uh, patients and clients and people over the years, uh, they describe their trauma. They, and what I, what I see from them is they cannot really move and grow forward in their lives because they're stuck. They're stuck. Whether And if you look at it, we see the images. Like a school was destroyed. Yeah. Lives, um, yeah. rather the girls' lives, like around that, that whole, you could say the village, right? The mentality of the whole village there together. Um, and I don't mean the physical location of the village, but I mean that mentality of friends and family and, and the whole uh, relatives and everybody's a community, right? They're all impacted. And it's almost like, in the, and what I have seen is that people put this trauma aside in war torn type of situations. They put it aside just to survive. My personal experiences with uh, widows and orphans in Iraq is that there's no time for them to, let's say, mourn the the shahada yeah. the martyrdom of the the man of the family who went to fight in al hajj al shabi in iraq against isis there was no time sure. to mourn the woman let's say the mother had to immediately find a job re immediately find a source of income if she wasn't working to survive to feed her children so you see there's no time to deal with that trauma they have to move forward or children who witnessed that they there's an effect and we're going to get into the the details of that i don't want to skip but uh but but essentially it is a it, it is something that freezes people from developing and moving forward but you see so many survival stories of people succeeding despite those challenges as well and we'll get into that in a moment inshallah definitely okay okay sister barak let's talk about coping strategies now 
what are coping strategies? How would you define them? And for these people to be able to survive on a daily basis, what coping strategies are necessary? So coping strategies, when we're talking about this type of trauma, essentially it's how we handle and deal with the situation in order to manage the intrusive thoughts, the, the emotions that are involved, how we interact with our environment. So essentially how we deal with the situation, right? And there are certain yeah. strategies that can be used to help them. So w when I'm talking to somebody who's dealing with depression, we use cognitive behavioral therapy strategies trying to change the thought to elicit a change in behavior, right? When we're dealing with somebody who right. is dealing with, let's say, dysregulation of emotions, then we use dialectical behavioral therapy strategies, looking at how to regulate emotions, how to get them to a wise mind mentality of, of regulating the emotions down so they can cope and deal with the situation without their emotions getting out of hand, right? So there's so many yeah. different coping strategies for different types of, let's say, traumas or mental health illnesses or mental health uh, challenges, right? So here, what I can say is I cannot tell you how to treat somebody in, in Afghanistan, the Hazara people in Afghanistan, or the Palestinians in Gaza, where they had a whole family wiped out. I can't tell you how to cope with that. Recently, there was an, a car accident in Lebanon that took the life of a mother and her four daughters who were on their way to the airport to pick up their father, whom they haven't seen in a long time. And I can't tell you how, what kind of advice I could give that grieving father and the family. I can't do that. I think when there's that immediate trauma or the immediate incident that happened, it's, it's to be there for them, right? It's to be there for them. It's to help them with giving them food, even though they probably won't even want food. Their appetite could be gone, right? Yeah. Uh, they could be just Ooh. dealing with sleep or sleeping to avoid the situation, right? Um, so when I say immediately, I, I can't give advice in terms of how to immediately, in terms of what we can do for somebody other than be there to support them because there's a lot of shock, denial, and not a person may not know how to deal with the situation right away, especially when you're looking at it from a, a macro level where there's like a whole community of people impacted, right? And so from yeah. a strategic level, from a therapeutic level, there's there's different strategies. And this I would say is more for people, let's say in this part of the world, because people in the other parts of the world, they're dealing in that constant exposure to the violence and the trauma. It's, it's about survival. It's about getting, they've got five minutes to get out of a building before it's bombed. They, yeah. they you know, this, like how can we even begin to think that, right? Thanks. That constant yeah. Iraqis yeah, the Iraqis for the longest time lived in fear of, you know, when you leave your house, you don't know if you're coming back. And so there's this tawakkul uh, ala Allah and that, you know, you're in the hands of God when you leave the house, even if you're going to school yeah. or getting groceries or to work. So I, I recall that fear that my even my own family lived in. I can only imagine sitting here living in this part of the world in North America where you've got, you know, okay. electricity, you've got somewhat safety although recently we see that there is now this fear especially of muslim women who are visible with their hijab a fear of going outside in case they're going to get run over by a truck or another attack yeah. because they look visibly muslim so so when we talk about how do we cope with these strategies i can't i think it'd be pretty um what's the word out of place for me to give advice to people in those places I can't do that. I, I think it's pretty, I, I don't think I can, unless I'm there on the ground and, you know, offering that kind of support. Heck, I'd probably be even traumatized myself ex uh, seeing all of this, right? So there's also that trauma yeah. that can be transferred over when you're vicariously, when you're seeing it through other people. So that's something to keep in mind. So I'm not even going to begin to pretend that I can give that advice. I'm not going to go there. The only advice that I, I give is, let's say, when, uh, when I did go down to Iraq and I sat with... Uh, uh, women who were widows, what we did for them in terms of coping strategies because of the trauma they experienced is that we provided 
wellness circles for them, right? And so we uh, groups okay, for them. Yeah. But this, That's a good idea. This, yeah. this, wasn't a week, this wasn't a week after they lost their husbands. This was years, months after they were going through their own coping survival, right? And so when the, right. their needs are all about, I need money to feed my children. I need food. I need clothing. I need this. This is their basic needs. Once these basic needs right are met this is almost of maslow's maslow's rather uh hierarchy of needs so i i uh, advise people to check that out but essentially what it is is that you've got your basic needs that need to be met which includes survival before you can go on to the next level of needs to be met and so when we're talking about yeah. mental health that's probably the last thing on their minds so alhamdulillah these women had some of their basic needs met so that when these wellness circles were offered for them it was an interesting experiment so to speak a pilot to see how they interacted with that they had the space where they were finally talking about what it's like to be a widow in iraqi patriarchal society where it is you know predominantly male male dominant right and and so the women have a different role but there's still a very strong role in the society there but what does it look like for a female woman that has all the stigma against her because she's either divorced or you know widowed and a, a single woman essentially with children and how do men look at her how does society look at her? how does her family look at her and, and so you see it's a very different dynamic and so in those spaces these women were empowering each other you know you have this one woman let's say who is very strong in the sense and resilient in the sense that yes i've been through all of this trauma but i'm not going to stop myself from living life i am still going to wear red because traditionally <laughs> a widow black for the rest of her life mourning her husband yeah. and absolutely is honor and honor and in uh, in uh, honor in mourning a loved one however she said i'm not wearing black for the rest of my life he would have wanted me to have sure. lived and enjoyed life. So you see, there's this optimistic positivity. And then you have the women who are dead set on wearing black for the rest of their lives. Poor me, woe me, not really empowered, you know? So you see the dynamic of how this woman would empower this woman. And that could be part of that strategy of being inspired by other people who, despite gone through similar tragedies and trauma, are still going to be uplifted and say, you know what, I'm going to make the best out of this for me. I'm not going to let society dictate onto me how I live my life. And I found that so refreshing because, you know, as soon as we talk like that, it's like, oh, these are Western feminist type of ideas. No, these were coming from Muslim Shia widows who are followers of the Ahl Bayt who have been through so much that you and I will never see in our life that have not seen, inshallah, we never will. Yet look at how they're speaking. Yeah. And this comes from Mashallah. a beautiful place. I know, so beautiful. beautiful. It is, it is, and I love seeing that. So this would be my examples. Now, quickly, uh, for those who are living in this part of the world who have families there, it's a different it's a different scenario. There's that constant fear and worry what's going to happen to them. I've spoken to Palestinians who worry about their families in Gaza. I've spoken to, well, as Iraqi, you know, we lived that for the longest time. Um, my Afghani friends as well. So we can relate yeah. that way, right? And so when we talk about right. strategies for us, in terms of general coping strategies, in terms of our perspective, like let's say for us who witness these atrocities through social media, yeah. in terms of how it impacts exactly. us, of yeah. course it impacts us. I, I recall personally, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, as soon as we hand out, found out about the Hazara girls, and then right a day or two after it was the, the Palestinian attack, the attacks on Gaza, we couldn't focus. Sure. We felt very down. We couldn't, honestly. Yeah. yeah, we were very so sad. That, that, pain, <laughs> that pain hadn't gotten over of the Hazara girls. And, you know, the next day we're hearing the news about Palestine and we're just like, what's going on around the world? Really? It's, it's, a, it's a mental attack on us, you could say, right? Like you feel it right here. You feel weighed down. You feel very heavy. You feel very sad and helpless in the sense that you cannot stop it. Now, here's the interesting part. So let's get into how it impacts us. Like we know how it impacts us. Like you're gonna lose sleep, like you said, uh, loss of appetite, not gonna be productive in work. Your focus and attention is deterred. Feeling of helplessness, right. of not being able to do anything. So when we talk about coping strategies, we we look at four aspects. We look at the emotional, the physical, the social, and the mental. Right. So let's take a look at some ways of how to deal with each one of these. So let's look at emotional first. Emotional coping, what we want to do 
is find ways to soothe and regulate our nervous system because it is activated right now. You know, our, right. all the hippocampus, the amygdala, all of these emotion function, functions of the brain, they're all like this. They're just really activated. We want to regulate them back down. So it's recommended right. to use soothing music, halal music, of course, here in the implication when we say music is halal music, right? The soothing relaxation music or other positive sensory okay. inputs calm our nerves. Here's where the Islamic perspective of using dua, Quran, you know, listening to beautiful sounds like that can, and it's been shown in research to soothe our sense of peace, right? So, and also yeah. Allah in the Quran, verily with the remembrance of Allah. Allah, do our hearts find that serenity and peace, right? Another way is to do mindful breathing, right? To soften the emotional responses. We want to lower our heart rates, right? To, to get that the blood really needs to go in to relax yourself. Now, from a physical perspective, we take a look at exercise, right? Focus on involving our, uh, our whole body, getting rid of these stress hormones essentially is what we're doing, right? So we have to ensure proper regular sleep, which is almost nearly impossible, but it helps us to restore ourselves when we do that. There's a um, rebuilding and generation of cells during the sleep cycles, right? right? And of course, balancing our diet without using substances that can harm us, right? So keeping it balanced, not a lot of sugar, not a lot of salt, depending on your your physical um, well-being there. And we look at it from a mental perspective, we want to figure out our thoughts that trigger, that are related to the trauma, right? Using mindfulness, which is observing our thoughts without judging and, and denying and, and pushing them away, to accept what's going on and to de-stress ourselves, right? Consider talking to a therapist can really help if we're unable to mentally cope, it can really help us work through it. And finally, socially, we want to turn to each other for support, right? It, right. Discussing trauma is maybe an optional aspect of dealing with it, but definitely turning to each other as a community, as a family, outside our immediate community. And we see so much support from people who are, let's say, not Afghanis, who are not Palestinian, who are not Iraqis, who are not yeah. Muslims, in the case of what happened in Canada, yeah. who are showing love and support and are just amazing that way, right? So we want to engage right. with others to avoid being isolated as well. I think isolation can really uh, enhance these emotions that we talked about right and thinking yeah. about doing support groups as well and so what we have seen here in the form of that is we've seen in the form of protesting people come out right. in thousands all over the world as we've seen protesting what's been happening in palestine right you've seen yeah. that the 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 psychology of the group right the cohesion of the group right, when you exactly. see that it's I, and i'm sure you've seen that around, too sister. around the globe it was around the world you feel a that sense of community, community, a sisterhood, yeah. a brotherhood, that together in one voice, exactly. you were standing against an apartheid, a genocide, together. Now, here in, North, in Canada, we also have to acknowledge living on a land that was stolen, right? That was not our land, and we came as immigrants on land that was taken over by colonialism, right? We also have to acknowledge right. what has been happening, here, and it's coming out more and more. Recently, 751 lives were found, bodies were found in a mass grave here in, in Canada right. and, and of the indigenous children of residential schools. What kind of generational, intergenerational trauma is this going to be triggering? It already has. Our hearts are breaking to think that 751 children who were of this land originally were taken away from their families to assimilate into a different religion and culture, to completely annihilate their language, their rituals, their ways, because of a dominant culture that felt superior to them. What does this do to the generations after of families that lost their children, their brothers, their sisters, and other family members? It can really, really impact you in, in a very profound way. And, and I see this when I see on social media, when I see families talking about this one, people sharing stories of their ancestors, right? It, and as Muslims, right. we get that. We connect with that. Yeah. How? Well, if you look what's happening in Gaza, I'm not getting political here, but I'm just linking everything here. If we look at what's happening in Palestine, this was an indigenous land belonging to the Palestinians who were of different faiths, now taken over sure. by a colonial 
colonial entity by the name of Zionism, right? And slowly, right. if you look at the map of the years, it's exactly what happened here in Canada. People may not like to see that or think about it that way, but that's exactly what it is. It was a land that belonged to the indigenous that was taken over by the colonialists. And these people were ethnically cleansed. It was genocide, apartheid. I mean, we have here the indigenous living on reserves that don't have clean water. Right. Huge suicide rates, alcoholism. All of these, all because of what happened in terms of the forced colonialism all on them. So we see the intergenerational trauma coming through the young people still living in places like that and witnessing that, right? And us, right. let's say, as let's say Muslims, we say, well, you know, that doesn't really, it's not relevant to us. How can we say it's not relevant to us? Yeah, I can. When we look at land, right, that doesn't have water. When we look at Karbala, there was no water given to children no and water. families and people we see the relation right there. We value water. And yet here's water that is being not provided, right? So when you look at it and, and you see how you can connect everything, this is where we feel for the other. This is how we work through and, and, and just processing everything. We are more connected than we believe we are. I mean, we think sure. we are. We're all connected, right? We're all part of this one body, this one ummah. And if one part part of it is heard, like the tradition of our Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the other part hurts. Very right? true. So it, we, cannot, we cannot separate like that. It's like the us, you know, us and the others. No, we're all together. We're all the yeah. same human breathing. Like all of us are the same, as Aristotle says, all men are alike when they're asleep. All right. This is so profound. Yeah, and I, use my I use that in my therapy with my clients using philosophy as well. I find it such a humbling statement to say that we are all the same. We're all alike, especially okay. when we're asleep, right? So when we start looking okay. at the other, the other, this is what separates you, right? And this is where it causes racism, discrimination, the superiority. And this is where hate comes in. This is where the belief that you can exterminate, that you could hurt, that you can get rid of people because you don't look at them as human beings, right? Again, I know we got a little off track there, but this all interconnected when we take a look at well, how, how do you even cope with this? How do you even deal with this when you feel helpless on this side, right? And the idea is that you have a lot more power and we'll get into that in a moment, but you do definitely have a lot more power than you think you do to help these situations. Definitely. Now, uh, Sister Barak, um, you know, when we talk about being resilient in the face of tyranny, what does that mean? Now, when I, when I see that statement or hear resilient in the face of tyranny, there's only one image that comes to my mind. Sayyidah Zainab, salam Allah She was, I was resilient. just going to say that, yeah. yeah look, as soon as I hear the word resilient and then tyranny, that, that's exactly what pops up into my mind. Now, I'll, I'll get into that in just a moment. But let's look at it from a psychological lens here. Essentially what resilience is, it's the psychological quality that allows people, uh, that allows some people to be knocked down by the adversities of life and come back, you know, at least as strong as before. So rather than these letting these difficulties, these traumatic effects or failures, let's say, overcome them and drain them, the highly resilient people find a way to change the course and emotionally heal and continue moving towards their goals. And so we see with, right. in research, psychologists, what they've identified, there's some factors that appear to make people more resilient. So such as having a positive attitude, optimism, mm -hmm. the ability to regulate their emotions and the ability to see failure as a form of a helpful feedback. So let's, let's apply some of this now to what I initially said, you know, what comes to mind when I first see resilience and, and tyranny, say to Zainab salam alayhi, where it, she witnessed trauma unheard of before a kind of like mass killing of her, of her closest family and loved ones and who were the descendants of our beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam and so this woman had to bring up all of her strengths everything that she had ever learned in her life to apply in those moments 
when she saw member after member of her family being killed, including her own sons, and then her brother, of course, right? So you see how strong she stood in the face of that, where she protected the women, right? And the children as best as she could when they were attacked, the burning tents. She protected her nephew, Imam Sajjad from being killed as well. Imam Zain al-Abideen, like when he, yeah. So, so you see how she had to be very strong and resilient despite everything that she had seen. And what's fascinating is what we read and learn about her after what happened in the tragedy of Karbala is after when they were taken from city to city, how she stood strong and how she spoke, even though her heart was breaking about what happened, even though they were chained and humiliated as the family of the prophet, she stood strong in the face of that. And she spoke in Kufa and sent the whole city in tears, weeping and regret of what they have done when they were humiliating them as they were paraded around like slaves. She stood in front of that. And then we know the story when she went to Damascus, when they were taken across the hot desert land to Syria in Damascus in front of Yazid. And what she did there in the courts of Yazid is how you and I can call ourselves Muslims today. This is my opinion. And, uh, and I know I re I've read a lot and we, we've all read, you know, and listened to lectures and so we formulate our own impressions of, of that. And this is my personal impression of, I truly honestly believe had it not been for Sayyidah Zainab, you and I would not be wearing the hijab today. The way she stood and spoke up. I agree on that. Yes. Yeah. That, I'm not going to get into the whole story. But, we all know it. And another time, but yeah, we, you see we, what we know for a fact that the, the history of uh, Karbala has passed down to us um, is most of it is because of Sayyidah Zainab and she didn't cry until she went back to Medina. Imagine for her sons. Exactly. She never cried yeah. until she went back to Medina. And exactly. that's when she, she actually released, relieved herself from the trauma and that she had experienced on the grounds of Karbala. Yeah, and you see, that. and you see it in the form of majalis, right? And the, where the women, and when we look at it from a psychological lens, the the majalis offer that space of grieving together, support. When we were talking about not being alone, right? Grieving together, supporting right. each other, understanding, and just being there, having that community. And we see that today in our majalis, whenever a loved one passes away, or when we're doing majalis for Ahl al-Bayt salam, we see that, right? Being together as a community. Right. I know it's been hard in the pandemic, but just that sense of community. So. So just to wrap up quickly, we see Sayyidah Zainab had a goal, right? She had a goal. Right. She had to spread the message of what happened in Karbala, continue on with what Imam Hussein started. And this was her role, right? And psychologically, she she held in her emotions and she reframed her emotions, you could say, of sadness and horror of what happened, reframed that into strength and sent the message across very clearly to the point where they were sent back. They were left in Medina, uh, sorry, in Sham for a few days and the, the wailing of the women, the crying of the women, what happened to the daughter of Imam Hussein Ali Salam. See, all of that, it, it caused a ripple effect. And they were sent back to right. Medina, right? Where for that year, and some say she lived up to a year or two, not much longer, some reports even six months. Yeah. I personally believe that she, like a woman like that, and the, the role that she had of the Ahl al-Bayt the strong, resilient woman and the message that she had, she was shaking mountains at that time. I don't believe she died Surely a natural agree. death. Like yeah. we see the history of how the Ahl al-Bayt were killed time and time and martyred because of the message that they were they're having to the tyrant that they were living at the time. So the same thing you could say for Sayyidah Zainab potentially. Again, this is just how I, I look at things. And I know a lot of people, some scholars share this as well. Um, but she was then taken back to be closer to the tyrant at the time to try and silence her, which is uh, why she was buried in um, in Sham, right? So interesting, right. the lessons that we can learn when we talk about resilience. It's, it, we are not expected to be like these women in the sense that, oh, you know, be patient when you go through difficulties or you have mental health challenges or trauma. I don't think it's fair because this is a different trauma. Every person has their own valid trauma that they experience and go through. And it's really important to not compare. However, to draw strength and be inspired from them, this is how we can use it as a coping strategy. Because people say, well, 
you know, look at what happened in Karbala. Look what happened to Lady Zainab alayhi salam. You know, be happy that you still have this. Be grateful for this. And I don't, th that's not helpful. If, if anything, it invalidates the trauma the person is going through when we compare like that. Rather, again, we use them as a source of inspiration to help us cope rather than compare and say, you know, your trauma is not as difficult as this trauma. That doesn't help. That makes things worse, right? And, you know, when we talked earlier about what can we do in the face of these difficulties, what can we do when we feel helpless in, in over there right. and we're here, you know, I do believe right, right. that it's yeah. possible. Yeah, that each of us has a role to play in, individually in that whole ocean causing that ripple effect, right? If we see what's happening now, okay. example, we see what's happening now in Palestine and what's right. happening outside. And use that as an example. We see what happened in South Africa. Had it not been for people using their voices and calling it for what it is, a genocide, an apartheid, we're using the same language now. We've never used that language before. For as long as you and I probably can remember, we've never heard this used in the, in such a manner with this specific cause. And so social media now has a huge impact on canceling people, cancel culture, you know, and 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 showing the truth of what's going on in the world and then when you see what's happening you know 100 200,000 people in australia are protesting or 10,000 in the uk london or in the states or in canada and other parts of the world in the muslim world despite the fact that some of these countries have relations let's say with the enemy right the leaders of those countries yeah. and you see the people grow, this is true. inspiring this is inspiring never think that your voice doesn't have an impact because especially in this part of the world where we can lobby we can petition we can put pressure on our elected ministers in parliament right government officials to say yes. something to do something they want our votes in order to get our votes they better do what we want right so and they show up at our protests you know with the palestinian flags and you know just speaking the sweet talk but unless they take action and action means cutting so ties, not selling military equipment to these countries, not sending aid right. to these countries from taxpayers' money. So how does that work? Well, you have a say in that. You have a say to put pressure on your government. You have a say in boycotting products. Just the example the other day, and it's got nothing to do with politics, but you saw uh, um, the uh, the football player. I'm going to say his name so bad here. Right. Uh, <laughs> Christian Ronaldo, there we go. He you saw yeah. how he moved Coca-Cola bottles and immediately after you see the millions or billions of dollars, you say, because this is not healthy, put that away from, give me plain water. One person who happens to be influential, just moving that, what did that do? It, it caused a huge dent. People who are, let's say Muslims, who are buying, uh, women who are buying products, let's say from Zara, and we see the other day how yeah. the head designer of Zara said some pretty horrible Islamophobic, racist, discriminatory like, things. Yeah. Imagine all that, yeah. all of some women who used to buy Zara products and clothing, if they boycotted that, how much of a dent are they got in that uh, in that company? So you have the power to do so much. If you research, look at what people's doing out there, using social media in a, in a proper way, using your voices locally and, and petitioning and lobbying and putting pressure on your government officials in countries where you can do that. Absolutely, there's so much that one person can do so you don't feel helpless. Going to protest you think doesn't have an impact? Are you kidding me? When people see other people protesting together and constantly raising your, their voices like that, it lifts up the morales. And this is also sending a message to the people who are oppressed. We are with you. We are not so forgetting you. We're with you. We're with you. And when we put did the Karada vigil on Parliament Hill and then went to the Iraqi embassy, it was so emotional. I'm remembering now because it was around um, this time a few years back. It was so emotional that we were telling our, our people in our country, we're not forgetting you just because we're living here. We feel your pain even though we didn't live there. We didn't go through it. But we support you. We love you. We're sending our du'as. We're sending our prayers. Never think that your prayers don't have an impact. They absolutely do. Thank you so much, Sister Barak, for sharing um, amazing, very 
valid points, very practical points um, that can help the audience understand what really trauma is all about and um, the oppression that the world is going through right now, um, especially people in Afghanistan, Palestine, um, I don't know, Myanmar, Bahrain, India, so many places we can talk about. And um, it was nice uh, learning things from the psychological point of view, um, from the lens of, um, uh, what do you say, uh, the media as well. Uh, because we've seen that the media doesn't always portray everything 100%, especially the mainstream media. It always Absolutely. shows like the partial, yeah, it always shows uh, things in a very uh, partial manner. So, you know, we don't really understand what what's the right thing, what's what's actually the truth, basically. So, um, Alhamdulillah, that, it was a very nice, thing, yes. And that's the thing, sister. So just quickly, I know we have to finish and wrap up. It's so important right. when, when also for those who are feeling helpless is to call out your media, local and national. And we've been doing that here for quickly here in Canada, they were calling the, the white uh, young man who killed the family as, you know, um, showing right. pictures of him in a prom and running and making yeah. him look safe, showing his mugshot. We called him out. Of him. Yeah. Call him and they showed his picture he, running in a marathon. Imagine. <laughs> and he's he that just ran just over <laughs> very bizarre but yeah. then this is where you have the power you have to call out your media and we've done that on radio in writing on television you have that power call it out as it is to change the narrative of the media because that has a huge impact on the other people who are seeing the misinformation out there thank you so much sister Barack for joining me today on Youth Matters. We had a very healthy discussion and inshallah, um, I can't wait to discuss with you more in, in the coming month, inshallah, uh, as we mentioned that we'll be having our monthly episodes. Uh, so inshallah, we'll be wrapping up today's episode. Uh, we will be seeing you next week, uh, inshallah, with another guest and an amazing topic. So please do catch us uh, on Youth Matters on Hidayat TV. Thank you. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.